Samuel. We're in 1 Samuel tonight. Um, excited about starting some new books. We're starting the book of Romans on Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to preaching Romans chapter 1. There's some tough stuff in Romans, man. It, says, it starts out with a bang. Uh, Paul wasn't, isn't messing around, man. And that's a good book. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. I'll be preaching that this Sunday morning. But I'll be preaching here from 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll start in chapter 1 tonight. And then we'll work our way through, Lord willing, one chapter at a time. I know we're going to preach uh, one message from this chapter. I think chapter 2 may, may break down into a few more messages than just one. It may be two or three. But uh, chapter 1 we'll cover tonight. And uh, get the feel for it. See what message the Lord has for us in this chapter. The Bible reads here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, Now there was a certain man of Ramath Tham Zophim. Wow. How do you like that? You thought Bible believers, Church of South Lyon was tough. Tell them you're from that place. Amen. Of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Panina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was uh, that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. And Lord, I don't take lightly uh, the fact that people went out of their way to be here tonight. And I thank you for it. I pray, Lord, you'd give them a message. I pray that they would know when they left here that they heard directly from God. Lord, somebody's sitting here tonight, I'm sure, with some kind of a need in their heart uh, that I know nothing about, but you know. And so, God, I pray that you'd touch them. I pray that you'd give them answers to their prayers. I pray that you'd give them uh, light in the, into their own heart and into their own, uh, Lord, their own soul, uh, their own need, and that you'd show it to them. Father, perhaps somebody's here tonight not saved. Uh, they don't know for sure if they died today that they'd go to heaven. I pray, Father, if that be the case, that you'd start convicting them by your Holy Spirit right now. That they realize what they're missing in life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that before they leave here tonight, Lord, they'd seek us out to say, Can you show me from the Bible what it means to be saved? And that they'd be saved before they leave here tonight. Father, what we all need is Jesus Christ. And for those who are born again and who do know Him as their Savior, what we need is to be more like you. What we need is to be pleasing in your sight. Father, I pray that you'd show us from this story tonight what we need to see. Divvy up the Word of God as you see fit to every individual. Father, I want to be a blessing. And I know Mike Reagan and Mike Reagan's spirit can't be. But I'm sure that Mike Reagan, as a vessel of God, uh, filled with the Spirit of God, preaching the words of God, directed by God, can be. And so I pray, God, you'd use me as a tool in your hand for that aim. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now here in 1 Samuel chapter number 1, this whole book starts out showing you a woman who's suffering through no fault of her own. She's got some things that she greatly desires in her life, and her desire is to have a child, but God's closed up her womb. She's a type of the church because she's really a virtuous woman from what we can tell. She has godly desires. It's a godly desire for a woman to want to have a baby. That's a good thing. That's a natural instinct. Nowadays, women kind of look down on, you know, stay-at-home moms or, oh, you're just a mother, as though as somehow an inferior job and their worth is whether or not they got a career or an education or how much money they make. But in all reality, that's truly not what God wired a woman for. 
Now, if you work, that's your business. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm saying this, your number one calling in life is not only to love your husband and to, and to take care of your husband, but it's also a natural thing for you to bear children and be a keeper at home. Is that not what the Bible teaches? Here's a woman who wants to do that. Now, before you write me off and get all upset, my wife works, okay? But I'm saying naturally in her instinct, she's wired to have a husband that she's able to look after and take care of. And God knows we sure enough need to be taken care of. Amen, fellas? And not only that, but to have some children. And this woman here wants to have children and she can't. She's a type of the church because her desires are right. And yet in this world, she suffered greatly. Now, you aren't going to hear that, going to, you're not going to hear that preached from pulpits today, but in all honesty, if you're a born-again Christian and you're a part of a good Bible-believing church and you're trying to serve God, that means that you will suffer some level of persecution. Life is not all hearts and flowers for born-again Christians. We don't give the, the plea to come to Jesus Christ because you're going to have your best life now if you do. The plea to come to Jesus Christ is not so you can live a better life. The plea to come to Jesus Christ is because you're on your way to a devil's hell without him. He loves you. He wants to wash you of your sin and give you a new lease on life. Amen. Amen. You're a new creature if you're saved. It's a great thing, but it does not mean that now all of a sudden your life is charmed and you have no more problems. Here's a good woman, and she's suffering in the passage. Here's a good woman, and she seems to really be beat down and depressed. However, she handles her suffering in such a way that by the end of the chapter, she's got an abundance of the blessing of God on her life. I don't know about you, but I realize one of, two, one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to wind up blessed or cursed. There's no in-between. I know one thing is for sure. I know that in this lifetime, I have suffered, I am suffering, and I will suffer on some level. So I don't want my sufferings to be wasted and to wind up putting me in a position where I'm cursed of God, I would rather handle my sufferings in such a way that God has designed them in my life so that they can then produce the blessing of God on my life. I don't want to waste my opportunity. And frankly, suffering for a Christian is a great opportunity. Because the Bible says if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. So how are you handling your sufferings? This woman handles them right. I want to show you in the passage how she is a type of a good church. So let's take a look and see. The first thing I want you to see is a good church has a burden. A good Christian has a burden. Look at verse 4. And when the time was that Elkina offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughter's portion. Unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved her. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Her adversary also provoked her sword for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. You know what her burden was? Her burden was to produce a seed. Her burden was to have a child. Can I tell you something about a good church? A good church will have a burden for lost souls. A good church will care about those in its community, in other communities, and around the world that are on their way to a devil's hell. A good church has a heartbeat to see souls saved. And yes, I'm a Bible believer. Amen? Knowing our position on the Bible, many would call us Ruckmanites, for which we do not apologize. They can call us whatever they want, as long as they understand we believe every word of the Word of God. Amen? My wife showed me an email today that was kind of encouraging, man. It was, a, it was a, email, a mass email sent out by the president of some Bible college, and I won't name it. But he sent out a mass email. You see how sweet I'm getting as I get older? Ain't that a blessing? I'm not naming it. That's pretty nice, ain't it? Now I'm tempted to name it. <laughs> he sent out a mass email because he had to fire one of his Greek professors. Well, he shouldn't have had a Greek professor there in the first place, as far as I'm concerned, unless you're teaching it to prove the King James of the Word of God. But most of the time, they're not doing that. And in the email, he says, you know, we believe the Masoretic text, the Texas Receptus, and the KJV. That's kind of the root of his problem, that, he, that, that Texas Receptus is a dead language. So what's the point in even messing with it? 
wasting your time when you've got a living book in front of you. Amen? I'm glad there's two of us here. But I mean, at least the guy fired him. Amen? I, that's a blessing to me. I, I'm thankful for a few that are left that believe the Bible at some level. I believe every word of this book. And yet, for some reason, those of us who do believe the Bible, who do dig in and study the Bible, we fall so in love with our knowledge of the Bible that we fail to care about the milk of the Word. We fail to care about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We fail to care about that one that needs the Lord, that's on their way to hell. They need God, man. Don't we care anymore? A good church is a burdened church. I want to get my burden for souls back. I've heard some preachers say this, you know, uh, this church wasn't built on, you know, soul winning and all that kind of stuff. It was built on a need to study the Bible. That's perfectly fine. I'm not preaching against that. You got an area where there's a ton of Christians around and there's no Bible believing churches. God will, the Holy Ghost will start a Bible believing work so those people can go somewhere and learn the Bible and get fed if there's no Bible believing work around there. And there's people there that want it. God will do it if they pray and look for one. God will, God will get something started. You know how this one started here? This one started here from scratch. And the last thing in the world I wanted was a bunch of disgruntled people from other churches bringing their stinking baggage into our church and starting a power struggle with the preacher right out of the gate. So I said, you know what we're going to do? By the grace of God, we're going to go knock on the doors. We're going to try to win souls for Jesus Christ. We're going to go after them until they come. Then we're going to disciple them. And by the grace of God, a church will get going. And if God's in it, he'll send us Christians that are like-minded. But I'm not going after them. That's part of the whole method to the madness of not putting Baptist on the sign. If Bible believer is not good enough for you, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I, that's what we are. Amen. You know what? God bless that effort. You know what I want to see? I want to see that thing kick up again. I want to be a good church. I don't want to lose my burden for lost souls. I don't like these Sundays that go by where there's no gospel message because there's really not any visitors that aren't saved. I think we need to get back to the business of caring about souls and being burdened about those souls. Listen, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bring his sheaves with him. Well, you know, brother, you're not rightly divided. That's Old Testament. Why don't you get your head out of the sand? Quit trying to prove why everything can't apply to us and why our lack of fruit is blessed of God. God may have a purpose in it for a time. I get that. I know not every Sunday do souls walk the aisle, but I'll tell you this much, folks. We've seen week after week after week where people regularly did get saved in our church. And we go through a dry spell that sometimes starts to last just a little bit too long. And sometimes I've come to realize I try to hang on to people too much. Too worried about losing people. Trying so hard to work things out. And sometimes i got to just stop and say, God, if you need to prune her back, prune her back so the fruit can come again. I'm sick of seeing people come and go and seeing nobody saved. I mean, a group this big, we ought to be winning them to Jesus Christ. It's not rocket science. It's effort. We go forth, oh man, we've been trying, we've been doing more than we've ever done before. We're out there and we have this year, we have people been out all the time. I think the problem is the church has lost her burden. I know I'm guilty, I'm not preaching down to you tonight. I get distracted, I get busy. I get other things that take over my time and my mind and, and I got other burdens in my head and I got to get ready and I got six messages a week and go, 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 go. And, wait, and then, oh, yeah, and we got to go door knocking. Yeah, we got to go pass out the... Listen, how about the weepeth part? We're going forth, nothing's happening. Oh, I guess God's not good on His promise, huh? He that goeth forth and weepeth. But you see the burden, folks? A good church has a burden to produce a seed. This woman, she wanted to have a baby. You folks realize when you join this church, what do we say? We'll work together to see souls one for Christ. Isn't that what we say every time? You know why? If you're not actively a part of trying to see people saved, you become a problem. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to become evangelists. 
Okay? Don't be like, oh man, he's all fired up and now he's going to be pressuring us to go door knocking every day of the week. No, I'm not doing that to you. You don't have to come here at a specific time and, and, and go at a specific time. Why can't you pass out gospel tracts to that person you see every week at the gas station? Why can't you talk to your neighbors, your friends, your family members? Why can't you try to bring somebody with you? It doesn't always have to be organized and motivated and pushed and pushed and pushed by the preacher. I'm not trying to turn everybody into street preachers. You understand that? If you say, I don't want to go, please don't go. You understand? Do you understand me? Please don't come if you don't want to come. How, now, just mark that down because you won't hear very many preachers say that. I would rather have four or five people that want to be there than 20 people with 10 of them not wanting to be there. Come because you want to come. Don't come if you don't want to come. Listen, you can be a part of winning souls without being the evangelist. I get it. Not everybody's wired for that. But can't you pray? Why can't you spend some time on Sunday morning before you get to church asking God to send some lost people and some visitors into church on Sunday morning? Why can't you ask God to help the preacher to get a brain and make some sense out of what he's saying and fill him with the Holy Ghost? I mean, if God used Balaam's ass, he can use me, amen? Let's just spend some time praying for the preacher, praying that souls will get saved. We ought to have a burden as a church for souls. We ought to care. A soul-winning church is truly a healthy and a happy church. I'm thankful for the, for the time that God, you know, allowed me to spend in funny mentalism. I went, you know, a couple different Bible colleges, man, it's a, it's, a, it's a world out there. But there are a couple things you can learn from everybody, you get that? Man, I miss that. I, I love that passion for souls. You can be a part of it in prayer. You can be a part of it just enjoying and rejoicing and seeing people come. Hey, how about this? How about you're not the one that's really good at going and getting them? But when a visitor walks in, you can be the one to say, hey, man, how you doing? We're happy to have you. can shake my hand. We're happy to have you today. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt you, I promise. How about that? You see, a soul in church, there's more to it than just, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. Good. When we bring them in, befriend them. When they come, pray for them. Have a burden to produce some seed. See, she's a good woman because she has a burden to produce some seed. That's a natural burden. You know what's funny about little kids when they get saved? You mark it down. That little kid really gets saved. And, I, you know, this kind of stuff, you can't, you know, create a doctrine out of it. All right? Did you hear me? You can't create a doctrine out of it. So let me say this a little bit more gently because it's not a doctrine. What I've observed is in my opinion, when I see a child genuinely get saved, one of the first things they always do is want to go tell somebody. I had a five or six year old that one of mine got saved. First thing she says is, I got to go tell Lily. Like, honey, she's three. Just chill out, okay? It's okay. Let mom and dad handle that. Oh, I don't want her to go to hell. <laughs> we'll take care of it. We took care of you. We'll take care of it. Please stop. They naturally want to go tell somebody about the Lord. You realize a healthy church is a church that wants to tell people about Jesus Christ? I don't know what it is, but there's a joy in it, isn't there? We go out street preaching, and on the way down, everybody's like, you know, they're trying to you know, be the tough guy, you know, and the face is just white, and the nerves, the hands are going like this, you know, can't stand still. But man, on the way home, after we kind of got the guts up and did it, what's it like? When are we going again, preacher? It's like, chill out, man, we can't go every day. Why? Because there's a joy that comes from soul winning. Man, that woman wanted to produce some seeds. She's a good woman. You know why, though? Look at verse number 11, and now let's put the balance on it. She wanted to produce that seed for the right reason. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Her motives were right. See, she didn't want to produce that seed so she could walk around bragging about her baby boy. She didn't want to produce that seed so she could one-up her adversary. She wasn't in any competition with anybody else in the church. It wasn't, you know, well, how many did you win? Well, how many flyers did you pass out? None of your business. How do you know how many you won? You don't. 
How do you know that person wasn't just faking a prayer to get you off their steps? It's not a competition. We ought to desire to see people saved. We ought to desire to produce fruit for God because we want to give it back to God. See, it wasn't about her. John the Baptist said it best. He must increase and I must decrease. Boy, how about that for Lord, make me a soul winner so you can get glory. Lord, allow me to lead people to Jesus Christ so that I can give them back to you. It's very, very difficult for us because our human nature, our flesh even raises up in our service to God. In the things we do for God, our own human nature can arise in our hearts and our motive becomes off for what we're doing. I mean, the first time somebody says, hey man, that's a blessing, your visitor came. That's really great. Man, they got saved. Now all of a sudden you start getting the big head like you're something special. Like, wow, man, I'm really spiritual because I went out and I got saved somebody and nobody is, hey, God might dry your fruit up to show you who really does the work. Her desire was to bring forth that seed to give it back to God because she owed God something. Yeah. Sunday morning, we're going to see it. I'm a debtor. You realize I owe this world something? If you're not saved tonight, I owe you something. God gave me something I don't deserve. It's called debt. You realize you put something on a credit card? That does not prove that you're rich. You got something you don't deserve. And you owe it back. When you got salvation, friend, you got something you don't deserve. You didn't earn it. It ain't because you're smart. It ain't because of who you know. It's because of the grace of God. So what about that next person that needs what you've got? You owe them something. They don't know. Folks, we live in an ever-increasingly ignorant world as knowledge increases. They're void of wisdom. They're void of the knowledge of God. We get more and more knowledge of things that don't matter and less and less knowledge of God. Nowadays, we can't even raise a family. Marriages can't even stay together. America is in such a mess. We are a shipwreck as a nation. The people around you need the Lord. Welcome to the new mission field. It's the United States of America. They need us. They need what we've got. But we're getting more and more quiet because we're so paranoid about the stinking politics and about whether or not we're going to lose our American dream. Hey, God, help us to get over it and start telling them about the Lord. We owe them something. And we owe God something. He is good enough to give us the gospel. Man, if you, had it, if you had it good enough by the grace of God to be born into a Christian family, my word, man, you don't think you owe everybody else something? You know what happens to us? Get that. I just don't understand. Did you see all those tattoos? Did you see all those piercings? What's the matter with people nowadays? Hey, let me give you an epiphany. You know what's the matter with them? They don't know the Lord. That's what's the matter with them. I, I just don't understand that. You'd look just like, you'd look like a pin cushion too if you didn't know Jesus. But acting like we're not the same as the next person. We need to get them what God has given to us. And if God has been good enough to you to allow you to be raised in a Christian home, you ought to be that much more indebted to the world, that much more indebted to others. But for some reason, since we had it so good our whole life, we all of a sudden become less effective for God instead of more, and it ain't right. We own something. We owe God something. She was trying to do it for the right reasons. You know what else I noticed about her that made her a type of a really good church? Not only did she have the a desire to produce seed and to repay what the Lord was going to do for her, but you know what else I noticed? Look at verse number 7. She stayed faithful in spite of the blessed, lack of blessings in her life. And as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Year after year went by, and this woman continued to suffer. But you know what she did? She stayed faithful. Can I tell you, that's so much easier said than done. I'm telling you, man, that suffering can wear on you after a while. It's called, we call it burnout. I'm telling you, what it really is, is pressure. I'm just burned out. No, you're under pressure. The devil's on you. The world's against you. And I, I, keep, I keep referring to it. 
And I, I, every single time I've referred to it, it's never been in my notes. So I think it's the Holy Ghost because it's Bible, all right? As you get to the end times, that Antichrist, that spirit of Antichrist, what's he going to do? Wear out the saints. Wear you down. So preachers call it burnout, but what it really is is it's pressure. It gets difficult to stay faithful when you don't see the blessings. And you know, it's, it, you guys really, has, has, how many of you, you guys have been here two years or more? Let me see your hand. Okay. Have you not seen in the last two years how when visitors start coming and the building starts filling up, the whole excitement level in church goes right up like that? Has it, have you noticed that or am I crazy? I mean, people will get here an hour early to be in church. I pull in an hour early and there's people that beat me there. It's like ridiculous. This is, come on. He's got four kids and they're all one year apart. What is he doing here already? If anybody doesn't know who I'm talking about, it's obviously Rob. Amen. Amen. Deb too. They're, they're, they're one. Amen. And the excitement level just goes up like that. But then when there's a, a time where the blessings don't seem to be flowing and it's struggling and this person's miffed and that person's mad, these people are dropping out and, you know, well, I think pastors should follow up with them. How come they're not? You know, what you don't know is pastor probably sent them 40 text messages and tried to call them 10 times and they refused to acknowledge, you know, totally. They drop off the edge of the planet and, you know, what's really wrong? They wanted their worldly life and pop in church on Sunday morning and be treated like everything's great and go back to their worldly life. But they don't want to be preached at Bible and expected biblical Christianity in a local church. Too much accountability. So I'll cut and we'll go to 242. I'll get some emails on that one. Where we can literally start out with a real rock song and then we'll kind of like segue into the Christian rock. Which is nothing more than rock. What fellowship hath Christ with Bile? Dark, never mind. Anyhow. We'll go over there where we can jam out for Jesus. A rock song in church? I'm not talking about Christian rock. Trying to get the world in. Get the world in. Let's reach the world where they're at so we can come be just like the world, act like the world, and leave and continue to be worldly. And then pop in on Sunday morning and get our fix. So they disappear. You know what happens when they disappear? I told you an institute. I haven't really said it from the pulpit, but I think I, I was actually off on the number, but in the last 12 months, 25 to 35 plus people had just kind of like, and it wasn't like a big split. It's just these people had this issue, they had that thing, they had the other, they had the other. And you know what happens? Everybody starts going, what's going on? Well, we're still running over 100. Praise the Lord for that. That's a good thing, man. That's a blessing. Praise the Lord. I mean, seven years from nothing to... That's a blessing. But I mean, you know, low Sunday were 90 people. Where is everybody? I don't know. I see 90 people here. That's pretty good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Realize if we had everybody that has ever come through the doors and stayed for three months or more, we'd be what, 250, 300? That's not an exaggeration. 200 easily. But you know what happens when the fruit, when the blessings don't seem to be there? Everybody starts getting. You are Christians. Oh, it's me. Where is everybody? I don't know, but I'm here. And by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost is here. I know we got the book. You're here. Let's worship the Lord. Let's preach. Let's sing. Let's be happy. It's hard to stay faithful when you don't feel like the blessings are coming. She was. You see a good church, they'll just stick it out. They won't just cut and run. Don't get your nose bent all out of shape and be out of here. See, she had lots of excuses for why she should quit. Not only is this whatever you'd call them, the husband's other wife, that right there would be enough to make any woman want to kill herself. That's ridiculous. But the other wife is all blessed, has all these kids. That's pretty stinking discouraging. On top of that, she's... Nagging her and nagging her, nagging her. Aren't you thankful for a New Testament? <laughs> Ladies, aren't you thankful for a New Testament where God said, husband of one wife? You're not? <laughs> what is going on in this church, man? I think we're going to change the subject matter of the preaching tonight. <laughs> wow. That's a blessing, man. Here she is being harassed by her. There's already, there's already major conflicts 
in this situation every time. That's why God said to preach your husband of one wife, you can't manage a church in more than one wife because you have nothing but fighting going on all the time at home. Amen. And then you come into church and they're fighting all the time. It's too much. You know, you can't do it. You'll kill yourself. You'll quit. So she's got all kinds of problems going on. Her adversary is provoking her sore. And then she goes down to the house of God and there's the preacher, Eli, who the Bible tells us is a fat man and he's got two sons who are lousy, no good for nothing, rotten dirt bag boys. And we'll see it next week. They're dirt bags. So the picture is a preacher that seems to be in the ministry for himself. And his boys are just completely unrestrained. And it's like, well, you know, they got to make their own decisions. They're grown men. You know, I'm just going to love them. And I'm just going to, you know, they're my boys. So I can't, you know, you know, what are you going to do? And here she is. God, all I want is one baby I can give to you. That's all I'm asking. God, is that too much? You gave him two, and you haven't killed them. You ought to kill them. God did eventually. You have her, all these kids. God, ah, what's going on? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been trying to serve God the best you know how? And it seems like God is not blessing you and you look around at people obviously blatantly even in the church living like the devil and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it and you look over here at somebody who's not really necessarily living like the devil but she's full of the devil that's the other wife and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it and there you are in the middle with everybody going what's wrong with you How come God ain't blessing you? How come you don't have any kids? What's the matter, honey? God's the one that opens the womb. I guess you got some issues, don't you? God sure is judging you. Hey, you know what? Even if I don't have the blessings of God, you know what I can have? Faithfulness. That's what she had. What about these churches up the road? They're exploding, man. They put in traffic lights so the people can get out. I was late. I had somebody walk in and say, I was late getting to church because the other church was letting out. <laughs> you don't know what that does to a preacher, man. <laughs> a Bible-believing little ho-dunk preacher with the white sterile building set way back off the road going, God, please bless us. Please do something. Please help us to see a soul saved. Sorry, but the guys up the road who had the light show and the smoke machines and the rock band and all the money and everything, they were lighting out, so we couldn't get here. That's why we were late. <laughs> Leave earlier next time, brother. God bless you, man. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Glad you didn't just pull in, you know. You know how that feels? You know what you can do? You can stay faithful. A faithful man who can find. I want to be faithful. Whether it seems like God's blessing me or not, if I know I'm doing as right as I know how to do, then I'm just going to keep doing as right as I know how to do because that's all I want to do and God will figure it out eventually. That's a good church. A good church is also a church that knows how to handle its bitterness correctly. Stay with me now. A good church knows how to handle its bitterness correctly. Watch. Look at verse 10. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. You folks realize every person in this room, I'm in this room, every person in this room has opportunities to become bitter and everybody in this room from time to time gets bitter. I've never been bitter, brother. You're full of hogwash. You've lived your life in a little bubble, and whenever you move out of your mommy's house and start paying your own stinking bills and have somebody to tell you something you don't want to hear, you'll get bitter. I mean, I'm talking about real life in the real world. You'll get bitter. Every one of us has had an opportunity. If you live at home with your parents, I'm not trying to bash on you. Not talking about you, you're here tonight, but you know what I'm talking about. This spoon, you know, silver spoon in their mouth. Parents pamper them their whole life, pay their bills, raise them for them. No, don't let them get out in the real world and handle their own deal. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So don't take it personal if you live at home. Like, man, Pastor hates me because I live at home. <laughs> Bitterness is available to everybody. Penina had a right to be bitter. You know why? Look at verse 5. Unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah but the Lord had shut up her womb. You know, she's sitting there 
and her and all her kids. She's given this man all these kids, right? He's going to love me because I gave him all these kids. You know, that ain't necessarily how it works, but that's how it works in a woman's head. You know, listen, ladies, can I explain something to you? The only reason children exist is because we fell in love with our wife. Amen, fellas? You were never like, man, I can't wait to have kids. I mean, once in a while, you'd be like, yeah, that'd be cool to have a kid someday, right? And then you're over it, right? Right? What's the matter with you fellas? Really? I was never like, I can't wait for children. I just want to hold that baby. Oh, I just want to hold her. You never found me sitting over there with a Care Bear and a blanket imagining that it's a baby when I was in my 20s. It didn't happen. Amen, fellas? Single guys, help me out. Amen? You always wanted, you wanted a wife, amen? He loves Hannah. And she's over there like, man, I had all these kids, and I thought this would mean something to him. It meant something to her, but he obviously loved Hannah. And she's like, all she ever does is work it. You see her, oh, I just hate her. She's always working it. She's like, oh, I'm just tired for me. I can't have a baby. Well, I can't have my husband. You know, God said in the book of Genesis, her desire was towards him, right? And she didn't have her husband. She had a reason to get bitter, didn't she? You think about it from her perspective for a second. Boy, she had to hate Hannah. You know, she had to hate her. I mean, pure, unadulterated, deep hatred. You know what she also had to do? She had to hate that husband. You guys, you guys realize how real life the Bible is? That's right where you live, isn't it? I mean, not, you know, the whole multiple wives thing, but it's just real life, isn't it? She had to hate that man. Yeah, she's just like, you know, what about me? She had a reason to get bitter. You know what she did with her bitterness? She handled it wrong. Hannah had bitterness because of her pain. Verse 6, her adversary provokes her sore. So then she's got this problem. She's got an adversary. She, she's got a womb that God's closed. She's got an adversary that's constantly provoking her and torturing her every day of her life. She's wearing her out. It's like that person at work, you know? Wears you out. Every day. She can't escape it. She's on her. She's on her. She's on her. That mouth, that mouth, that mouth all the time. Boy, that can be worse than a death sometimes. That can be worse than, that's just torture. And then she goes down to the house of God. She's wanting to get a hold of God, man. And she gets down there, and that preacher looks over at her. And he says, hey, woman, quit your drinking. A preacher misjudges her in church. What a reason to get bitter. Look at verse 10. She's in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I'll give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. Shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. She thought when she went to church, she'd get a break from the old lady. But now the preacher's starting in here, misjudging her motives. What he's doing, he's looking at the outside, and he's sizing it up. I've seen this before. I'm good at it. I do it all the time. I know what this is, but what he can't see is the heart. See, God sees that. Nobody else does. So he makes a harsh judgment call real quick. Now watch this. Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Verse 15. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunken neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Watch verse 16 for those of you who know that Jesus turned the water to wine. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. You know what she's saying? He says, put away your wine and your strong drink. She said, I haven't drunk. He said, put away, why, why are you drunk? And she said, I haven't had wine or strong drink. Don't count me a daughter of the devil. Oh, Jesus turned the water to wine. I'm glad you got one verse memorized. Just go destroy your life. If that's what you want to do with the Bible. God will let you do it. That thing's written to test your heart too. Amen. 
So she's getting misjudged by the preacher. You know how hurtful that had to be? She's pouring her heart out to God and he's butting into her prayer life and saying, hey, don't you come up in here drunk. What a stinking hypocrite. You know what his boys are doing? In church, in the building, on the premises? We'll see it next week. They're pigs. They're, they're getting fornication in the house of God. And he's saying, what are you doing in here drunk? Now, they're both wrong, but what do you think would be worse? Man, I went back, when the, back in the day, we were in the storefront. I got a phone call from a, from a wife. He's so crazy. He's so drunk. I can't take him anymore. So I go to his house and pick him up, bring him over to church. So come on, man, let's pray. Go down to the altar. We're kneeling down there. We're on church. It wasn't a church service, but, you know, I was up at the church studying, so I went and picked him up and brought him back. I got him down to the altar to pray, and I was, I was praying for him, but my plan was to him to fall asleep so that I could go study. So he passed out on the altar. I mean, really passed out on the altar, and he's laying there sleeping, and I went and studied. He woke up an hour later, had a pot of coffee ready, and we sat down and talked. <laughs> I kind of think it's worse for them to be fornicating in the house of God than for her to be drunk praying. I wasn't drunk. You understand that? Don't go repeat this story the wrong way. He was. He passed out. I set him up to pass. I was trying to help his wife out because he was losing his mind at home. Okay? You got the picture? Some of you need to go soul winning so you can figure out what to do in that situation. I don't know. Good night, man. Give me a break. You're looking at me like, oh, would you still do that? Yeah, in a second, man. Those are great times. Amen. Praise the Lord. Really? That's hysterical. They take pictures of them, put it on Facebook. Come to our church Sunday. <laughs> She had a reason to be bitter. But there's a way to handle your bitterness. I'll show you something. You handle it one of two ways. You either handle it in the spirit or you handle it in the flesh. You want to see somebody that handles it in the flesh? I'll show you. Now you can mark them. Now listen, this is the issue. The issue is not what Hannah did to me, what my husband did to me. That's not the issue. You understand that? The issue is not, my name's Hannah, and I have this reason and this reason and this reason why I'm bitter. That's not the issue. Because no matter who you are in life, who your family is, how you were raised, what kind of money you make, where you live, no matter who you are, what church you go to, you are going to get reasons to become bitter. Understand that? So you cannot pass the blame on somebody else for your bitterness, no matter what. You know what they did to me? I said, no matter what, whatever happened, happened. You are now responsible today to handle yourself in such a way that God can get glory out of whatever happened to you in the past because Romans 8.28 is in the Bible and it does work if you love God. Okay? So the issue is not what was done to this individual. The issue is how is this person handling their bitterness? This is how it works. Circumstances or situations will arise, and what they will do is smoke out of you what's actually in you. Are you with me? Did you hear that? A circumstance or a situation will come up, even in church, where a situation finally comes up, and all of a sudden there's this boom! Everybody goes, oh! What did they do to you? And you missed the point because you missed the point. See, the point was not what did they do to you. The point was, whoa, where did all that come from? You can look at me, folks. It's okay. You can all look at me. I'm the pastor, all right? And I love you. And I'm, I'm not saying that sarcastically or to be snotty. I do, and I mean that, and I love this church. And I'm not here to hurt one person. You understand? What happened? No, no, what happened was something has been there a long time. It started out as a little zit, and it went past the cyst, and now it's a massive tumor. Not trying to be disgusting, but that's exactly what happens. And finally the excuse comes. And tch, there it is. And now everybody's going, oh, they did what? They're the devil. And you're overlooking the person that's puking all over you. Let me show you what I mean. Go to the book of James. Keep your finger here in 1 Samuel. James chapter 3.
You got 10 more minutes? I'll be okay if I'm done in 10 minutes. I know it's pushing it, but you, you poor people, you put up with it so graciously. I know the church would triple in size if I'd cut it back to 35 to 45 minutes. I get it, but you know, hey, I can only handle so much, so I want to keep it small for now as I grow into it. Amen? <laughs> There's a method to my madness. James chapter 3. Look at verse 11. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and what? Bitter. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Meekness is strength under control. It's like when the pastor could come and just kick the whole thing in the face. You know, he doesn't. He instead tries to explain it to you. That's, that's meekness. It's hard to do. It's not in my nature. God help me. If God helps me, I can do it. But it's not in my nature. Ask anybody that knows me real well and works with me real close. They're like, is he going to blow up? Is he going to blow That one passed. Wow, man, God's really in this ministry. That's why some of them don't leave. Amen? It's a, it's a, it's a living miracle because it's hard, isn't it? Especially if you got that kind of a spirit, naturally, in your human spirit. Some of us do. Some of us are naturally fighters, right? All right, watch. But if you have bitter envying and strife, where? In your hearts. Glory not and lie not against the truth. Well, you know, no, I, my motives are really sincere, and I really, and they really have a good heart. No, 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 no. You've been believing what comes out of the mouth, but you're overlooking the obvious fruit. Who's stupid enough to be like, I'm full of bitterness and I hate everybody. And I, blah, 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 blah. You'd be like, whoa, nobody does that. They present it spiritually. They present it like, I, well, I just, and it's not fair. And I just, and they lie to you. You understand that? They lie right to your face. They don't give you the whole story. This is a bitter person. This is what bitter people do. Because bitter people get to a point where everything is all about them all the time. So if you walk by them and somebody says, hey, brother, how are you doing? And they spit in your eye and you go, oh. And that brother was sitting right there. They're like, did you see him when he walked by me? He was like, oh, like he's so disgusted by me. He went, oh. And they didn't see that somebody else accidentally spit in your eye. And you're like, oh, my word, man, really? Everything's about them all the time. They don't see anything else but themselves. That's bitterness. It's a dangerous thing. So they, they, they lie against the truth. Look at verse 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above. You guys realize that with bitterness there's wisdom? Well, you shouldn't have done, they shouldn't have done that to you. I know they shouldn't have done that to you. That's terrible. It's the wrong kind of wisdom. It's earthly, sensual, and devilish. You know how the devil works in church, in your marriage, in your family? Bitterness. It's devilish. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. You know what happens when you pop that zit? You can't believe how much pus comes out of that thing. I'm not trying to be nasty, but really, it's just the best way to describe I'm sorry, folks. I will get some class eventually. Amen? <laughs> but it's like, whoa. What, what, why? That thing boils and boils and boils and boils and boils and there's strife and strife and strife and strife and strife and strife. And it's a difficult thing, especially in church, because a pastor's praying like, God, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt others. I want to be careful. Lord, I, you know, what do, I, what do you do? But the longer the thing goes on, the deeper it gets, the nastier it gets. And it's like, oh, it's a difficult thing. Go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you another verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews 12, 15. Now here's a warning from God for you. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When somebody gets bitter... They start spewing it out, and you know what happens? Other people get defiled by their bitterness. You know what's crazy to me? And I've seen it multiple times in church. 
Somebody will start all kinds of trouble. They'll be all upset about something. They'll, they'll, you know, nowadays with Facebook and everything else, it's amazing how much of a mess they can stir up in no time. People that don't even know you are casting judgment calls on you. They don't know you or the situation. They're foolish enough and simple enough. And I'm not trying to be mean to them. God help them. I pity them. But they're fool and I don't say that arrogantly or sarcastically. I do pity them that they don't have the sense to think things through. But they see one side of the story and they're casting judgment calls on you or your church or your family or whatever. Facebook's a real mess, folks. If you don't think the devil's in it, just see who pops up from your past that should have been just forgotten in your in your mind and never come up again. See who pops up on Facebook. You know, feet caught in a net, never mind. We'll get into black helicopters next. But listen, some of you'll get that. But listen, here's the thing. That with, with social media nowadays, the devil's all over that stuff. And everybody likes to believe before you know it, especially, especially if you're friends with them. Not friends on Facebook. We seem to be real good at getting unfriended. It's kind of a blessing, you know. I mean, we never re-request. It's like, yeah, thank God, that's good. You know, but listen. Be careful because who you're friends with, when they get bitter, you get defiled by them. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And you're going to wind up, I'm, I'm warning you, you're going to wind up in trouble that's none of your business and should have never been a part of your life. You understand that? I, it just trust frustrates me because I've warned people in the past and they don't listen and then they're like, <gasps> when I actually come through on my promise. Be careful because when they start puking on you, even if it's not your own puke, you smell like puke. Get away from bitter people. They'll create bitterness in your life. And you, nobody did anything to you. You see, that thing is dangerous. People that handle their bitterness wrong start spewing it on everybody else. Now, how's the right way to handle it? Because we all have opportunities. Amen? Back in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we'll look real quick here at somebody who handled it the right way. Her name's Hannah. The first thing Hannah did is she kept her mouth shut. She's talking to God, but her lips are moving, but no words are coming out of her mouth. When you get bitter, keep your mouth shut. You know, people always say, man, I, I put stuff on Facebook and I regretted it later. <laughs> but it's out there now. You go delete your post all you want, but it's still there. You can say, I'm sorry. Listen, you can say, I'm sorry, and if you're around godly Christians that love you, they'll forgive you. But don't say forgive and forget to me. Because we don't forget, do we? You're not God. And the Christians around you aren't God. So it's a whole lot easier to put yourself in a position where you don't have to ask for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness is a great thing. Do it if you, if you ought to. But it's easier to put yourself in a position where you don't. How do you put yourself in that position? She handled her business bitterness right. She shut up, and what did she do with it? Where did she take it? To God. And she poured out her heart to God. That's the way to handle your bitterness, folks. Because we all get there. And you should be alone with God saying, Lord, man, this grudge is really growing deep. Boy, there are some people in this life, man, I don't get mad, I get even. <laughs> You know, that smile when your eyes are cutting their head off. Ah, oh, man. I seen a Muslim guy this week, you know, and he was about that far away from me. He looked at me and I looked at him. If eyes could speak. It's just, I feel that adrenaline start pumping, you know. And God said, he's going to go to hell, Mikey. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry. You know that. You know that thing, you know. <laughs> That's how you feel towards them. That bitterness in your heart. Best thing to do, keep that mouth shut. Take that burden to God. Take that situation to God. Pray over that thing and keep it between you and God. And you never know what God might do on your behalf. She canned it. She shut her mouth. She had that, oh, I could get mad and get even. That's a grudge. It's dangerous. You need to take that thing to the Lord and say, God, I got this thing in my heart, and I need to get it right with you, and I'm sorry. Would you help me with this situation? Would you help me with these people? 
Would you help me with this person, this individual? God, I need you. And he'll get in there and he'll start cleaning that bitterness out. The balm of Gilead. How many of you think having a bitter pastor would be a blessing? Can I see your hand? If you think it'd be all right for your preacher to get bitter. Paul said, how many of you are offended and I burn not? You've been offended? You know people in the church have been offended by me? You think that they haven't offended me, that I haven't probably been offended 10 to 1. Because you see, you can come sit in your pew and go and just fellowship with who you feel like and have your acquaintances and do your thing. I, I have to oversee the show. So I'm interacting with all kinds of people on all kinds of levels. This, this year has been one of the toughest years. Most people don't even know it. It's been a tough year. That's a blessing, by the way. I'm fine with it. I'm not complaining. Don't feel like, oh, Pastor, you need to say a word of encouragement. I know I'm, I'm happy. God's been good, real good. But you want a bitter pastor? You wouldn't think that's acceptable, would you? Of course not. Why is it, why is it acceptable for Christians to get bitter? Why is it okay for you? Amen. It's not okay. It'll destroy you. Right. Handle your bitterness the right way. It'll destroy the church. Yep. It'll destroy other people around you. She handled it right. And now you'll notice in verses 17 to 28, and we're not going to take the time to read it all because I told you I'd be done two minutes ago. But she becomes blessed by God. Why? In verses 17 and 18, she had the faith to believe God. He, he, Eli answers her, go in peace. God of Israel, give you your position, petition. You asked him. Go on, honey. God will give it to you. She said, okay. She got up and believed God before she received the child. A blessed church is a church that has faith. You know why you should keep trying to reach your family members, keep trying to reach your neighborhood, keep trying to get the gospel out, even if it doesn't seem to be working? Keep trying to grow, keep trying to come, keep trying to learn the Bible, even if you don't see the promise yet, because you got faith in God. That's why. You know what else she did? She believed in the power of prayer and fasting. In verse 7, she wasn't eaten. In verse 20, look what she says. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I asked him of the Lord. Why did you get this? How did this happen? Because I asked. How did, how did that happen? I asked. You guys realize prayer works? That's the point I'm making. Prayer works. If we really believed that, we'd pray more, wouldn't we? If we really believed that, when God answered our prayers, we would give Him glory. Number one, I don't think we really pray like we should. Number two, I think the times we do pray and God does answer, we have such short-term memory because we're so marketed constantly that we don't even recognize the fact that, oh, I prayed about that and God just answered. You ever stop and take inventory of the prayers in your life God actually answered? That'll blow your mind. God answers prayers, folks. And she had that down on her cross. This church, if God's going to bless it, we need to get it in our heads that God answers prayer and we ought to have faith in God even when we haven't seen it yet couple more things. Her labor in verse 23 was not for her own glory, but for God's. Elkanah, her husband, said, Do you do what seemeth thee good? Tarry until thou hast wean him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her child suck until, the, until she weaned him. She put all this work into this baby. She bonded with this child and everything else. And all this time she spent with her baby boy just to take it down and give it all to the Lord. Well, you know what I do for this church? No. I pay attention. I know what you do. But I'm making a point. Well, don't do what you do for the church. Do it for God. My wife said that to me this week a couple times. You know what? You know, we do what we do for the Lord. Because you know what? You're right. That was pretty profound. Because I wasn't thinking of it that way. <laughs> we do what we do for Him. And if you'll do it for Him, I think that's where the blessing comes. I love you. I'm thankful for our church. But I cannot serve you for you. I will quit. You understand that? I will quit. You know, as missionaries go to the mission field and suffer, go to Haiti with us if, you don't, if you're not sure about that. They don't do it for the people. Last time we were in Haiti, the guy's like, I can't stand these people. He is a Haitian. I can't stand them. I can't stand them. <laughs> he ain't there for them. He's there for God. And then God produces the love in him and the ability to love them and keep going. Do it for the right reasons. You know what it proves here? She loves God more than anything else in the world. And we'll close with this thought. 
Look at verse 26. She said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. A good church is a church that's willing to prove to God that they love God more than anything else in the world. A good Christian loves God more than anything else in the world. Brother Lentz told me years ago, he said, blood's thicker, don't ever forget this. He said, blood's thicker than the Bible. I said, what do you mean? You're all 20-something years old. Okay. Blood's thicker than the Bible, man. Don't forget it. You know what I've seen over and over again? He was dead right. Blood's thicker than the Bible. Family members offended. I know they're wrong. I'm still mad at you. My first church, I was stupid enough to fall for it. You know, you need to go tell them, and you need to let them know. And so I go, okay, well, man, if mom said to go let them know, mom meant it. So I don't care when to talk. I'm going to let you know. I was like, why'd you do that? Because when the baby gets offended, mommy's offended. What's the problem? The problem is God's not first. See, folks, we got to put God first. And if we'll be a church that'll put God first, even above what we love, God will bless us. Hey, you know how the story wraps up? Hannah gets five more kids. <laughs> now, let me leave you with this. If she'd have hung on to that one, he would have never become who he became. He'd have never done for Israel what he did for Israel. You would have never known her name. This message would have never been preached, and the other five kids would have never showed up. She handled her bitterness the right way. There's a right burden. There's a right way to handle your bitterness and there's a blessing from God. Let's bow our heads for prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank